Hello everyone, what's up? Some of you will already have seen my first History of the Forge World style of painting video. In this second installment, we will look at the main Horus Heresy releases in 2013, focusing on who designed and painted the models, and whether the style that we had already defined was maintained one year after the original release of Betrayal. If this sounds interesting, keep watching! Now, before we start, I must warn you that this is a rather long video. So if you want to grab a drink and a snack, now might be the right time. In my first History of the Forge World style of painting video, I looked at the initial Horus Heresy releases in 2012 and I drew several conclusions. I think it's important to reiterate these for the second analysis to be meaningful. The first one was that the dedicated and talented team of artists responsible for the heresy was led by Mark Bedford and Phil Stutinskas in terms of sculpting and painting. Furthermore, we proved that the Horus Heresy team deliberately chose a gritty, realistic style which broke away from mainstream 40k, just as the late Alan Bly had done in terms of narrative. Most importantly, perhaps, we established that the main trait of set style was the use of flat colors, the emphasis on weathering, and the notable absence of other techniques traditionally associated with Warhammer, such as edge highlighting or blending. Lastly, we also contended that the main event that acted as a catalyst in all of the above was probably the hiring of Phil Stutinskas, who was not only a world-renowned military modeler, but also an innovator responsible for the invention of weathering techniques such as hairspray chipping. My purpose with this second video is twofold. First of all, I would like to raise awareness about the Forge World style of painting, to help others appreciate it, understand its main characteristics, and as I have done, emulate it, if they so choose, that is. I know I'm a bit of a broken record, but there was a before and an after for me, in terms of my enjoyment of the hobby, from the moment that I decided to follow in the footsteps of Stuttenskass and Bedford as best I could. Secondly, I wanted to see whether the aforementioned conclusions still held true one year after the release of Horus Heresy Book 1 Betrayal. Did the style of painting change? Was the use of weathering still a defining characteristic? Were the same sculptors and painters involved? To answer these questions and more, let's start by looking at this White Dwarf magazine from January 2013. So, we're starting with two sculpts by Simon Egan, whose most well-known heresy work at this stage was none other than Angron, Primarch of the World Eaters. Here we can see how Egan carefully modified the generic Dreadnought sculpt to give each of these, one from the Death Guard and one from the World Eaters, their own unique personalities. This goes well beyond Legion Insignia. As you can see, there is a myriad little details that are subtly different, such as the cable in and grill on the 7th Legion Contemptor, suggestive of a rebreather mask, or the studs on the 12th Legion one, which are reminiscent of Roman gladiators. These subtle, tasteful modifications allow them to be used both as loyalists or traitors, making them more versatile. Now, it should be noted that on the next page we also have the Legion Command upgrade packs, but in order not to make the video unnecessarily long, I chose to focus only on whole models. With that in mind, let's now move on to another example of painted models, and one which is very dear to my heart. Here we can see a unit of 12 Legion Assault Marines, painted by none other than Mark Bedford himself. The writer explains that the way that Mark has weathered and detailed the models, complete with splashes of Crimson Gore and the dust of Isvan 3, makes these marines look like battle-hardened fighters. I cannot agree more. As with the other world leaders that we saw in the previous History of Forge World video, these sport flat matte colors and some chipping, but for the first time, we also see blood splatter effects. This was the first time that such an effect was used in heresy models, and applying it to world leaders has since become the norm rather than the exception. Given that this is one of my favorite techniques, I would like to thank Mark Bedford for providing us with this exemplar. If you're interested in the models themselves, I'm sure you can tell that these are Mach 4 Assault Marines, a unit which by the way was sculpted by Will Hayes, but they're sporting Phobos chain axis and World Leader's shoulder pads. And one of them also has a Mark III helmet, which I think is a nice touch. Now we're in February 2013, and it's time to check out Forge World's latest. First we have the Voss Pattern Lightning, a very unique flyer sculpted by Darren Parwood. This was the first Heresy flyer, but it was released both for a Heresy and 40k. The paint job, however, is all Heresy. We can see that it has been painted in the same style that we saw applied to other kinds of vehicles, 
in my first video. For instance, both the reds and whites are flat, with no blending or gradients. The edges have a lot of chipping, rather than edge highlighting. And to top it off, there's panel lining, increasing the contrast, and suit and burn effects in various places, such as the last guns or the vents. All in all, I think the paint job is clearly naturalistic in style. This looks like a flyer that could really have existed. We aren't told who the painter is, so if any of you are privy to this information, please do tell us in the comments below. But now it's back to the Legiones Astartes. These stunningly beautiful sculpts are the work of Mark Bedford. But again, I'm afraid I do not know who the painter is. Whoever it might have been, it seems clear that their emphasis was on conveying the impression that these were veterans of war. Let's break down what we can see here. First of all, all the white and purple panels are heavily chipped, showing the bare metal underneath. Secondly, all the gold details, including the more baroque ornamentation of the champion, are weathered as well, using a combination of washes, probably oils, and also chipping in other metallic colors. Overall, the paint job that has been chosen for these Emperor's children is gritty and realistic, even though we're dealing not only with HQ units, but with members of the fabled Third Legion, a legion of Asthetes. If you'd never seen these models before, this may have come as a surprise, as it's quite typical these days to see highly stylized Emperor's Children paint jobs with wonderful creamy blends, lots of highlights and non-metallic metals. However, the artist here, whoever it was, chose another path entirely, and I'm sure you will agree with me that this was not the result of either a lack of skill or effort on their part. Now, before we move on to March, we have a few more items to look at from the This Month in Forge World section. First of all, all fans of the novels like myself were delighted to see this preview of Simon Egan's Abaddon and Loken. The writer describes them as utterly magnificent, and I cannot but agree. Next, we see another preview, this time of the Richard Siege Squad, sculpted by Will Hayes. And last but not least, we have an example of a painted Sons of Horrors unit by Matt Murphy Kane. At this point, I should repeat the correction that I published in the comments in my first History of Fortune video. In that first installment, I stated that Phil Stutinskas had both sculpted and painted the Typhon tank that we examined. Now, it is true that he designed the Typhon, but the paint job had been done by Matt Murphy Kane. So Matt, if you happen to watch this, my apologies. The picture here was quite small, so I'm sorry for the poor quality, but we can definitely tell that Matt went for a subdued, rather dark sea green, which I think is very fitting, and both the Cataphracti and the Land Raider have been heavily weathered. There's quite a lot of chipping and both have great dust effects, which I think have been done with pigments. In other words, the style is consistent with the other models we've seen thus far. We're now in March, and you're probably beginning to realize just how long this video is going to be. Like the Terminators we're looking at, I'm slow and purposeful. The first unit this month is one which 14th Legion players are bound to be familiar with. The fabled Death Shroud Terminators, sculpted by Will Hayes. The sculpt does a great job of conveying the quiet menace and stoicism that used to characterize the Sons of Mortarion. The armor is heavily customized, but at the same time, it is austere and devoid of needless ornament, as befits the Death Guard. This paint job may be my favorite so far. I think the Death Guard scheme is very well executed here, with tasteful weathering which complements the sculpt beautifully. The Justaring Terminators, also by Hayes, are far more ornamented by comparison, but not to the point of becoming ostentatious or baroque. Similarly, the paint job is restrained, with the main focal point for me being the gritty weathered metals. Here you can see that another upgrade pack, this time with Volkite calibers, had just been released. But let's now move on to another preview. Here are the upcoming Horus Heresy reinforcements, with the Thalax and the Legion Recon Squad, being worked on by Will Hayes and Mark Bedford, respectively. These were exciting times for Heresy fans. Fast forward to May, and this issue of White Dwarf has quite a few things in store for us. The opener couldn't be more exciting. We get a full two-page spread about a Abaddon and Loken, which we had seen a preview of in February. Now let's regale ourselves with this stunning paint job, shall we? Here we have the first deviation from the style of painting that we had consistently observed so far, namely the use of glossy colors for the armor panels. This sets these two characters apart, which I think is rather fitting after all, and creates a striking contrast with the dusty ruins that they're standing on. However, 
My two favorite elements are the burnished metals on the one hand and the weathering of the base on the other. Both elements show an attention to detail which I find truly impressive. Immediately after this on the next page we have yet another stunning sculpt to feast our eyes on. This time a third legion contemptor dreadnought. Like a baron and Loken, and indeed the previous two contemptors, this was sculpted by Simon Egan. It seems clear that the artist employed the same style we saw with the Emperor's Children Champion and Master of Signal. I would bet in fact that it was the same person who painted both. If you know more, please let us know. If you like Contemptors, this issue is a treat for you. Next we have two more dreads, painted by Mark Bedford, and even though at least one of them was meant for a 40k army, I'm sure you'll find the style recognizable. In fact, the writer states that Mark has used a strong, simple color scheme, which he has weathered using forgeable weathering powders and citadel shades. And now it's time for some titans. Even though the next two models are painted using 40k schemes, given the importance of river titans in the heresy and the impressive level to which these two have been painted, I think they deserve at least a cursory glance. Wouldn't you agree? Here we have an Imperial River Titan painted by Matt Murphy Kane in a beautiful scheme of his own devising. Phil's Chaos River seems to be the exact same one featured in the seminal Model Masterclass Volume 2, which had been published a year before. I don't know about you, but I was quite astonished to see that Stutinskas had painted that whole river in just one day. Absolutely incredible. June was also quite heresy rich, as you will see. First we have the Rapier Graviton Cannon, a favorite of many Iron Hands players. I myself have three of these. I believe this really unique sculpt was a collaboration between Bedford and Hayes, but I can't confirm this at this stage. In any case, I think the concept is brilliant and really original, and in terms of the paint job, I would highlight the excellent dust effects visible here. Next we have a group of Iron Hands Breachers. We had seen a preview of the sculpt back in February, and four months later, here they are, in all their grimy, weathered glory. Similarly, the Recon Squad was work in progress back in March, and here it is now with a striking Night Lord scheme, complete with freehand lightning and camo on the cloaks. The next unit is one dear to my heart, as an Order Reductor player, namely the Mechanicum Thalax. These were being worked on in March by Will Hayes, and we can see them here in the same paint scheme with which they would eventually appear in the upcoming Horus Heresy Book 2 Massacre. This austere paint job really conveys the sinister nature of the Thalaxy troops with its burnished metals and those unnerving black faceplates. Last but not least, we have a preview and some painted models. Here we can see the work in progress sculpt of the Legion Praetor by Edgar Skomorowski. And on the next page we can see some Death Guard Assault Marines painted by Keith Robertson, another member of the Forgeworld Heresy team. Fast forward to September, another release heavy month, or shall I say super heavy. The Forgeworld latest section opens with the Legion Felglaive, which according to our Bolter and Chainsword thread, had been sculpted by Phil Stutinskas. However, various internet sources, such as SpikyBits, seem to quote a promotional email from Forgeworld, which stated that the sculptor had been Stuart Williamson. In any case, I think this is a tremendous paint job, which you can still see on Forgeworld's website, by the way. The two elements I would highlight here are the excellent dust effects on the one hand and the tasteful applications of a muscle burn effect to the main gun. The next model is a bit of an oddity, I would say. The Davinite Lodge Priest, an event-only model released at the Horus Heresy Weekender that year. I couldn't find any information on the interwebs about who the sculptor was, but thanks to Leaky Cheese, I now know that it was Mark Bedford. If you want to see an excellent unboxing and some more details about this rather unique model, check out his video. I will leave a link in the description. Moving on, we're now treated to another Primark release. This time it's Fulgrim, the Illuminator. This is yet another masterful sculpt by Simon Egan, but sadly I do not know who the painter was. The style of painting here is different to that used for other Third Legion models so far. There is no visible weathering, and the metals have all been highlighted. However, I must say I think this is fitting for the Phoenician, and the base offers a nice contrast to his otherwise immaculate appearance. In terms of previews, this issue of White Dwarf is also quite juicy. First we get the Legion Sikaran tank by Phil Stutinskas, Forge World's Master of Armor. And secondly we have two more famous heresy characters, 
Erebus and Corferon, or shall I say infamous characters. In any case, these were work in progress at the time and the sculptor responsible was Edgar Skomorowski. The October issue of White Dwarf magazine represents a turning point in the history of the Horus Heresy hobby. It marks the publication of the second Horus Heresy black book, Massacre, exactly 12 months after betrayal. Regretfully, I only have this issue of White Dwarf in Spanish, so any quotes will be my own translation. I hope you don't mind. As befits such an occasion, the heresy content in this issue opens with a two-page spread showcasing one of the Isvan 5 display boards that the heresy team had created. The picture here is really grainy, but I'm sure you can appreciate the beauty of the scene regardless. On the next page we get to the crux of the matter, a detailed interview with the late Alan Bly. He explains that, for the Horus Heresy fans, this event represents the dawn of a new era, not only because of the knowledge that they have access to, but also because of the armies and models now made available for the legions. He adds that the Forgeball team have created stories, rules and new miniatures for four legions. A bit later on, he also mentions that it will be exciting for many readers to witness the Legio Cybernetica for the first time, covered in detail by Will Hayes and Mark Bedford. This is a great segue for our next highlight in this issue, which is a two-page spread on the Mechanicum faction, with the two sculptors responsible for the range, evidently Will Hayes and Mark Bedford. Here we can see a sinister Magos Dominus for the first time, accompanied by three towering Castlex battle automata. This awesome Magos Dominus model is sadly no longer for sale, and the picture here isn't the best, but I can tell you that the paint job is really remarkable. The burnished, corroded metals are really striking, and the tasteful use of OSL is really fitting for a Cybernetica character equipped with deadly arcane weaponry. The accompanying Castellacs are more austere by comparison, but the chipped and worn flat reds convey the impression of there being heavy machinery, and the pigments on the base really complement the shinier metals nicely. Lastly, we can see a unit of Thalax painted in a rather unusual scheme which is totally different to the one we saw previously. Before we move on to December, we have one more unit preview. This time, the Sons of Horus River Attack Squad, sculpted by renowned painter Alfonso Giraldes. Like so many of the models we have seen tonight, these are still fan favorites to this day. So, if you're still with me at this stage, you've almost made it! Let's now have a look at the main Horus Heresy releases in December. There isn't a great deal of stuff this time, but look at those models. These two infamous members of the 17th Legion are now in their fully painted glory. Here we can see the only example so far of clear edge highlighting combined with no visible weathering, which leads me to believe that perhaps this was the work of someone outside the Heresy team. Be that as it may, I still think the miniatures look really nice, but I don't think the paint job complements the sculpt well or is really on par with what we've seen so far. In terms of previews, we have two upcoming new kits this month. First of all, we have the Legion Fire Raptor, designed by Stuart Williamson, and secondly, we have an old favorite of mine, the Castellum Stronghold, by Blake Spence. Sadly, the latter has recently gone out of production, but if you can get a hold of one, perhaps on eBay, I can really recommend it. So, what conclusions can we draw from today's video? Well, first of all, we've seen over 20 kits and one book being released in the space of just one year, which I think is quite remarkable. Secondly, we can attest to the incredible artistry of all the sculpts we've seen. These models are not only stunningly beautiful, they have clearly been designed with the greatest attention to detail and love for the Horse Heresy setting. It's almost like they're jumping from the pages of a novel onto your tabletop. Thirdly, we could see that the Heresy was truly a team effort, with artists like Hayes, Skomorowski, Spence, Williamson, Robertson, Murphy Kane, Parwood or Giraldes, in addition to Bedford and Sutinskas. And last but not least, we can safely conclude that, despite some exceptions, the style of painting that we had previously identified was still very much alive. Therefore, it seems clear that it was always part of an integral and lasting vision for the heresy. On a more personal final note, if you are curious about the Forgeworld style of painting, I would like to encourage you to give weathering a try. Not only is it a fundamental component of this style, it is also a lot of fun and really relaxing. Even if, like me, you're far from the level of master modelers like Phil Sutenskas, 
you can still easily learn how to use techniques like chipping effects, pigments or oil washes and strive to make your own models a little bit more like theirs every day. So if you want more in-depth horror heresy content like this, subscribe now and remember, in the grim darkness of the 31st millennium, there is only weathering.